All right, thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me all right. I'm a fairly loud talker, so that shouldn't be a problem. But if anyone can't, then you probably have to get your ears checked in the room as well. Uh, anyway, thank you guys for having me. Today we are going to be talking about making use of drone LiDAR data. So basically everything from what the right drone is, how to process it, some of the workflows, pitfalls, when to use it, really all things uh, LiDAR. But as I kick things off, I would like to say, please interrupt me. I actually really prefer in uh, meetings like this to uh, be interactive. If you guys have questions, I mean, a lot of what I'm talking about is not an academic theory of here's you know how to get the right stuff out of your LiDAR data. It's actually putting this technology into practice. So if you have questions, please raise your hand, throw something at me if I'm not paying attention, whatever. Try and keep it a, a little bit fun and interactive and uh, let me know, because ultimately that's what I'm here to do, is answer your questions and show you guys all everything that we've learned so far about how to make uh, the best use of drone LiDAR data. So for a little bit uh, to kick things off uh, about uh, Aerotox as a company and why we're here, we've been doing drone data processing for land surveyors since 2014. So we're not a hardware sales company, we process data, and so we process tens of thousands of photogrammetry data sets and uh, increasingly more and more LiDAR data sets as LiDAR becomes more affordable, practical, easy to use in a, uh, in a drone situation. As for myself, I'm the CEO and the uh, lead photogrammetrist of Aratos. I've got uh, a background in finance and statistics, and I've been working in photogrammetry and surveying the last seven years. I'm certified by the ASPRS, so whatever credentials, etc. Not that important, but really important is what I'm talking about. I'm actually giving two talks this, uh, this weekend. This one is uh, about making use of drone LiDAR data, which is a lot about the LiDAR technologies, workflows, that sort of thing. And tomorrow I have a talk that's going to be taking a deeper dive into the actual computational processing of it. The actual use of the software itself and uh, different workflows and algorithms and settings and inputs to actually further optimize that data processing aspect of it. This one's gonna be a little bit more high level about actually building out a drone LiDAR program, getting those major building blocks in place first. And the next one will be a lot more about uh, about the actual software technology side of things. And you can sign up, we are going to video record both of these sessions. Uh, if you would like a recording of those or a copy of the slides, they will be on aerotoss.com slash westfed22. And right now you can sign up that you get emailed when they're ready. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? We are going to start by going through the current drone LiDAR technology of all of the different options that are out there. We are gonna cover the workflows that it takes to actually go from flying a drone uh, with a LiDAR sensor to actually getting a final survey deliverable. We're gonna talk about photogrammetry integration. And uh, I know you were expecting a LiDAR talk, but there's actually gonna be a fair amount of photogrammetry talk in here because we believe that the best workflow is actually a blend of photogrammetry and LiDAR together. And so I'll be covering that uh, in some detail. We're going to talk about creating point clouds, geo-referencing everything, classifying your point clouds, vectorizing your features, and ultimately getting into CAD. But there's one guiding principle that I've said in all of my talks and really guides what we are as a business, and that is that if your drone program isn't saving you time and money, then it isn't working. We are here not to build, I've said this already, not to build academic programs. We are not here to build a research program. We are here to build a sustainable business for ourselves and for you, and that means one that makes money. You could easily, with cutting edge technology, spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on cool LiDAR tech, all this kind of fancy stuff. You can maybe spend hundreds of hours processing a single project's worth of data, and you won't ever use it again because your boss will uh, pull the plug and you're losing so much money. So I focus a lot, not just on how do you get from A to B, how do you get to LiDAR data, but how do you do so in a way that is practical and efficient and saves you time and saves you money. That's just not the, not the goal. It's not about just doing something that's never been done before. It's about doing it in a way that is much more efficient with a very useful and uh, repeatable workflow. And as part of that, I mean, we always say a good drone program should be getting you better deliverables than you got before. Uh, it should have the same accuracy or better than traditional surveys. With LiDAR, that means, yes, you should be getting easily uh, enough accuracy for half foot contours through vegetation or tenth of a foot better on hardscape and things like that. 
up-to-date high-quality imagery in all conditions, whether or not photogrammetry works there as well, and having that perfect record of site conditions that uh, a lot of the engineers, once they start getting spoiled with drone data on every project, really start demanding. It should also increase your flexibility. It should allow you to do new projects. It should serve as a force multiplier, meaning you can do bigger projects with a drone than you could with just a survey crew hand towing something through the woods. And something that can scale up and down based on need. Obviously, we live in crazy times right now where having all of the right people, all of the right equipment, the right computers or whatever is kind of in doubt. It's really tricky. So having that flexibility to be able to manage scaling demand up and down or scaling workforces uh, is really important to us as part of a just business practice. And as I've mentioned, save time and money, less manpower in the field, and reduce your overall cost. And to do that, we also need to avoid many of the pitfalls that are out there. And these pitfalls are so prevalent in drone technology especially. Number one, don't use the wrong tool for the job. A drone, even a LiDAR drone, is a tool. It is not the tool. It is not going to replace your GPS. It is not going to replace your total station. It is not going to replace a shovel when you have to dig things up. A lot of people say, I mined a drone and I spent, you know, so much money on it, I gotta use it on every project. Absolutely not. You'll wind up spending more money if you start trying to use the wrong tool and push it into, the, uh, into a job where it's just not supposed to be used. Also, don't overspend on gear you don't need. One of the things that'll be a little counterintuitive on a LiDAR talk is, I'm gonna talk a lot today about reasons you shouldn't use LiDAR. Because LiDAR is just a tool, it is a tool that is great, spectacular in a narrow set of circumstances, but does not do absolutely everything. It is not right for everything. So don't overspend on gear you don't need. A lot of you guys probably, maybe, don't need a LiDAR drone at all, and I'll make sure to tell you uh, who you are. And also don't spend too much time in the office. One of the cool things about uh, drones is that you can gather stupid amounts of data in the field very, very quickly. In a matter of hours, you can gather tens of gigabytes of photos, huge amounts of LiDAR data, and it's very, very easy to spend a huge amount of time in the office processing everything. The fidelity that you have on this data is incredible. You have points for practically every leaf on every tree on a project site, but you don't actually need to measure every leaf on every tree. You're typically there for a topo, an alta survey, anything, something like that. So get the data you need and then get out. That's part of a good work, uh, workflow. And then also, don't treat this like a research project. I've said that before, we don't treat it like a research project, and neither should you. This isn't, uh, this isn't a uh, college or anything where the goal is to spend a year to improve your accuracy from uh, one-tenth of a foot to nine-hundredths. No, this is a business. Don't treat it like a research project. A good drone program, honestly, is boring. And I love nowadays that it is getting so boring that it's, here's your drone, and you lug it out into the field, and you push go, and you sit, and you stare, and you lay your watch and say, ah, oh, it's just taking forever. That's what it should be. It's boring, it's repeatable, it's reliable. That's what makes it a good business. Drones aren't cool anymore. Well, a little bit. I mean, they are flying robots with lasers. That's literally what this talking about. <laughs> but they should be boring, and that's what a good drone program should be. Because at the end of the day, what you want and what your clients want is not a drone LiDAR flying laser robot survey. They want a survey. They don't care what it's from, usually. Sometimes they do. But uh, usually they just want an accurate survey to get their job done. So this is what it should look like. Some of it's going to come from a drone. Some of it might come from prior surveys. Some from the ground. Some from easements and underground utilities. We put it all together. And ultimately, it's just a survey. That's what the goal is. And that's what we're going to be talking about. How do you get from flying a LiDAR drone to a survey? And that's what matters. And so to start with everything, we, there's a lot of misconceptions with such a new technology as LiDAR. I want to start with the basics, which is exactly how LiDAR sensors work technologically. And the reason I'm doing this is because this often answers many of the questions that people have about what LiDAR can do, what it can't do, what projects are good on. So let's start with some, some of the basics of how LiDAR sensors work. So basically, it's a laser beam that sends out hundreds of thousands of laser pulses per second. It can measure multiple returns. It sends out that laser and it measures the distance from the laser back to the drone. It actually uses typically a wavelength that's invisible to the human eye. So LiDAR sensors, they can't, they won't hurt you if they're in your eyes. You also can't see it. There's no brightness or anything to it. And the raw point cloud is actually uncolored because it is using a wavelength that is outside of the visible spectrum of light. 
it's actually just measuring distance and intensity and a couple of other things, but it's actually, it's not measuring color. Whenever you see a colorized point cloud, that colorization is going to be applied after the fact in post-processing, typically with imagery or a camera that goes parallel to it. But the raw point cloud itself is uncolored. It is just a laser that measures distance. And so we talk about, you know, one of the big things of LiDAR, one of the big promises of LiDAR is vegetation penetration. A phrase often used, that I say myself even, is that it can see through trees or see through vegetation. And that's a little bit of a misnomer. The laser itself can't actually go through any vegetation. Rather, what it can do is when you're sending out literally hundreds of thousands of these laser pulses per second, it can find the tiniest little gaps in the vegetation in the, those leaves. So the way that it works, the drone sends down a laser pulse, and that pulse can actually hit the same pulse can hit multiple pieces of, of, uh, of a tree and measure the multiple returns. So that's what we mean, multiple returns. A single pulse sends down and it sees that it hits four different pieces of vegetation and it finds that gap through the vegetation to get to the ground. And that's what we care about. That's going to be your last return. That's, that's how it sees through. So the, the laser doesn't actually have any ability to penetrate truly through anything. A solid sheet of paper will block the laser entirely, but rather it finds the gaps. So that means, no, it can't see, see through the roof of a building, it can't see through snow, and actually, indeed, it can't even see through water. There are very specialized bathymetric LiDAR systems out there that are, for all practical purposes, in, uh, not usable for drones right now. They're very unusual. Talk to some of the bathymetry guys that know that stuff a lot better than me. I'm much more on the aerial LiDAR side. So yeah, it finds the gaps and leaves. It doesn't actually go through anything. It's also worth noting the vegetation penetration is good, but not perfect. There is vegetation that is so dense that you can't actually go through. Rule of thumb is if you look up and you can see gaps in the trees, then the LiDAR can see, uh, can see through it and find the ground surface. If it's so dense that you can't, which typically is only going to be in like tropical areas where you have you know major broad leaves in like Florida or the Bahamas or something, those have much more trouble even with LiDAR. But in, generally speaking, you can get good, very good uh, ground penetration. But it cannot penetrate water, can't see through snow, um, so part of why it's not you know, absolutely perfect, but it can do a lot. As far as LiDAR accuracy, when we talk about accuracy, one thing that's worth noting is that uh, X and Y accuracy, horizontal accuracy, is actually a little bit worse on LiDAR than it would be in photogrammetry, and a little worse than the vertical accuracy. <coughs> And that's because the, the laser itself, a lot of people think a laser is a perfectly, you know, one atom wide beam. It's not, it's actually a, a little cone. It's a pretty narrow cone. This is kind of exaggerated for effect. But the, the cone actually spreads out. So when it gets that return back, there's actually a little bit of, of width there that leads to a little bit of horizontal accuracy, uh, inaccuracy, I should say. And this is all exaggerated by the fact that this drone is, with its laser system, is flying typically two, three, four hundred feet above ground, and it is moving at 30 feet per second and kicking around in the wind and all that stuff. So, all of this to say, a drone LiDAR system isn't going to get the same uh, accuracy as a ground-based laser scanner that's 20 feet away from the target. Those are going to look way better. But, again, finding the right tool for the job is all important. Our testing has found that uh, with very, very, very few exceptions for drone LiDAR, photogrammetry remains more accurate than LiDAR on our screen. <coughs> that is part of why we, actually not part of, that is the main reason why we recommend a blended photogrammetry LiDAR uh, workflow is because on hardscape, photogrammetry remains more accurate. And there are, again, like all these things, a million caveats on the far extremes of technology with certain setups for cameras and LiDAR systems and blah, 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 but generally photogrammetry is more accurate. Yeah? Doesn't photogrammetry get a little confused on surfaces that don't have a lot of texture to it? It starts making kind of false matches on like uh, asphalt that doesn't have something for it to match onto. That is absolutely correct, and that is one of the uh, the other things that is that is true. So on perfectly smooth surfaces like freshly paved asphalt, photogrammetry does produce a very noisy surface. Sometimes you can clean that out in post-processing. A good CAD drafter can be able to pick out everything from oil slicks and paint striping to create a clean surface and set a line off of that. And LiDAR is a little bit better on those uh, those smooth surfaces. So yes, that is one of the uh, kind of outsider uh, examples. But generally speaking, Photogrammetry for curves, and even most roads, because most roads have enough texture and noise to them, um, photogrammetry is going to remain a more accurate 
uh, picture than the LiDAR sensor. And I've got some examples to show you that even include that, that noise you're talking about. Um, so as far as basic LiDAR processing, the way that this workflow goes, the laser itself only records the distance between the sensor and what it's measuring. It then needs to be combined with GPS, GNSS data, its IMU, gimbal data, and all of the imagery before you convert it into an actual point cloud. For anyone that's flown a LiDAR system, you know that uh, you fly the drone and it doesn't actually produce a nice, clean LAS point cloud. You need to go through a step that people call different things, pre-processing, pro-processing, post-processing. Everyone seems to have different names for it. Uh, but before you get to the uh, actual point cloud, and that step of creating your LAS files, creating your point clouds, is typically very custom to whoever the drone manufacturer is. They have their own software, workflow, that sort of thing. But it's usually fairly routine-ish. It takes a little bit of work, but uh, it's very hardware specific there. And point clouds, to talk about those in uh, a little bit, it's worth noting that they are a cloud, not a perfect set of points. So when I say a cloud, what we have here is an actual example. This is from a DJI L1 system flying, I want to say, 300 feet. Um, over, if you see, it's a cross-section of a road right here. So this is actually, you know, asphalt surface. And we have some spread in the point cloud right here, even though it's a hard surface. And that's just the statistical error that you get from the LiDAR system, the IMU, the GPS, processing all that together, you get a little bit of noise. But one of the things that is beautiful about LiDAR systems is that the average of this is going to be far more accurate than each individual point. Now this gets a little bit weird, especially because surveyors are used to taking individual shots, and by the time you take a shot, you have a very, very, very high confidence that that point is extremely accurate. With LiDAR, when you're taking hundreds of thousands of points per second, any one individual point may not be accurate, but the statistical average of many of these hundreds of thousands of points is accurate. It's a very different way of thinking of things that it's not, here's a shot, that's right. If I took this shot right here and said that point is part of the surface, I'd be half a foot too high. If I took this one, I'd be half a foot too low. But the statistical average is far, far, far more accurate than any single one individual point. And that's part of the LiDAR processing that we go through, how to convert a set of point clouds into an actual point tip surface. All right, any questions on kind of LiDAR fundamentals, how the laser system works or anything? Cool, let's keep going then and talk about the latest in LiDAR technology. So, first of all, why is LiDAR technology so popular right now? Not only among surveyors and people in this conference, but even among clients, we've started to see your end clients, that uh, they say, I want a LiDAR survey done. I mean, that's kind of weird. They don't often come in and say, I want a total station survey done. But honestly, we've noticed that a handful of high profile technologies have made the general public much more aware of LiDAR than other technologies that surveyors use. For starters, automotive LiDAR is really big. That's underpinning some of Google's self, or Waymo's self-driving cars. Um, a handful of other uh, self-driving car companies are making heavy use of LiDAR, which actually has been one of the major driving factors of why <coughs> drone LiDAR has come down and cost so much, is that the car companies put, have put so many billions of dollars into R&D. There have also been some high-profile Mayan ruins discovered in South America, which is very, very cool, and has been on National Geographic and everything. Um, it makes people aware of it. Heck, even the new uh, iPhones and iPads actually have a little LiDAR sensor on it. And before anyone asks, no, it is not good enough for surveying. It has a range of about like 15 or 20 feet. So if you strap it to your drone, it is not going to get you a good survey. But it's a really, really cool technology that Apple now has LiDAR systems on their drones too. And people just like working with the most cutting edge technology. And if they're willing to pay for it, then cool, that's great. And LiDAR does have a couple of unique advantages uh, that, um, that photogrammetry does not have. So vegetation is the one, and the other one that I, I don't think I have a specific slide on it until much later is uh, power line, power line corridor mapping is very, very, very useful for LiDAR. <coughs> LiDAR is actually able to pick up the precise path of the power lines themselves in a way that photogrammetry is not able to do reliably. But the LiDAR market, the LiDAR hardware market is very, very fragmented and complex and expensive. 
Up until very recently, to get a LiDAR system, you would have to work with a systems integrator that would buy the sensors, the LiDAR sensor, the flight hardware, the IMU, the camera, put it all together with an integrator, strap it onto a DJI drone, then you need someone to operate it, bespoke processor to process the data and all the software. It was just a lot, it's a lot of work. Not that it wasn't insurmountable, but it was enormously expensive, and that's one of the biggest challenges with this technology is it started very fragmented and it's starting to coalesce and become a lot cheaper and easier to use and more operationally reliable in that you don't need 18 months of experience hand building a custom drone in order to be able to operate it. You can operate one of these with you know a couple hours worth of training now. So when we talk when I'm about to get into some of the hardware examples specifically, when we evaluate what the best uh, LiDAR hardware is out there, we talk about accuracy, and accuracy is extremely important, but it is not everything. Accuracy, generally speaking, you want to be good enough, not absolutely perfect. If you want absolutely perfect, you better have a $100 million budget and you can go talk to NASA. They have some awesome laser scanners. That's how you get the best accuracy possible. What you want is accuracy that is good enough for the survey that you're doing. But also beyond accuracy, we want to talk about ease of use. If you only have one person in the entire planet that can operate your drone, that's kind of troublesome. They might go to another company, they might uh, slip and break their leg and be out of commission for a while, there are all kinds of things that can happen. You want something that's easy to use so that you go out, push a button, and it flies. It should be reliable. When I say reliable, that doesn't mean that the drone is going to fall out of the sky. Drones, have, from a uh, actual technical perspective have become so unbelievably reliable across the board that it's almost not worth talking about. But reliability of workflow. When you go out in the field, does it just work? Or are there so many different buttons and settings and issues that you go out, you push a button, and you get, you know, error code 36429, and then you have to pull up a manual and it's the whole depth. That's what we call bad, unreliable workflow. Not that something breaks, but it requires a lot of troubleshooting in the field and it's unreliable. You do have to think about cost as well. There's some spectacular LiDAR systems out there that cost a quarter million bucks, and they're really good, and they produce wonderful data, but it's gonna be really hard to get that ROI on a quarter million dollar drone. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's a heck of a lot harder. Meanwhile, a $40,000 drone might be the right system, even if it's not quite as good, because it's good enough, is what we often care about. And that's the cost of hardware, but you also have to think about the cost of operation. That's related to that reliability and ease of use, right? How expensive, how much do you have to pay the pilot? Do you have to pay him 150 grand because it takes such specialized training just to push go on the autopilot? And the biggest thing for today and tomorrow of my talks is the cost of processing. You can save 10 hours in the field and spend 30 hours in the office. That's not a good trade-off. So making sure that you evaluate all of these when building out your system is important because you can make a drone LiDAR system work. Lots of people have, and it's totally possible, but you just have to make sure to avoid some of these pitfalls. So when we talk about uh, drone hardware, generally drone hardware uh, falls into two categories these days. It's DJI versus everyone else. I wish that weren't really the case. I wish DJI had a heck of a lot more competition, but they are overwhelmingly the market leader in the, uh, the drone space, uh, commercial, right, everything drone, really. DJI is pretty darn good. They have a very, very simple workflow. They are relatively cheap, relative to the everyone else category, at least. They are quite easy to use, and they have very good, but typically not the best accuracy out there. Their downsides are they're Chinese-made, so a lot of people uh, for like government or military jobs can't use them. Their hardware support is almost non-existent, and they typically are not the most cutting, bleeding edge tech out there. They didn't re develop the first LiDAR system <coughs> by a long shot. Everyone else is typically going to make varying uh, other forms of LiDAR systems that are much more specialized to your needs. They're often, not always, made in the United States. They often offer better hardware support and will often offer the very cutting edge technology better than anything that DJI has. But the flip side is, they almost always have a much, much more complex field workflow that takes a lot more training, knowledge, understanding to run. They are basically always more expensive for comparable performance than a DJI drone and typically require some very specialized training. What's the right drone for you? I'm actually not here to tell you that because there are circumstances for each one of these drones to they have their place in the market. 
There is no best drone out there. There is only the best drone for you and your missions. As far as uh, what our favorite drone is, the DJI L1 is definitely the market leader, the most popular, and it's changed everything because it has brought the cost down dramatically. The cost of a full system with the DJI L1 sensor, which is a photogrammetry and LiDAR sensor simultaneously, it flies both at the same time, single flight, single payload, and it only costs about 40 grand, which is expensive certainly, but uh, in the realm of aerial LiDAR data, it is definitely among the, uh, the cheapest options out there. A little bit more about this, just because it's the, uh, the most popular one out there. LiDAR, uh, it has its LiDAR sensor plus a 20 megapixel photogrammetry sensor at, the same, sensor at the same time. It typically gets about two tenths of a foot vertical accuracy using the LiDAR, and you can still get a tenth of a foot vertical accuracy uh, using the photogrammetry workflow. Uh, fully integrated RTK PPK, 40 grand, pretty easy to use and a very reliable workflow. So we really like it. Um, it's worth noting the DJI LiDAR, it isn't even actually a DJI sensor, it's a LiVox, it's the actual light laser scanner that's inside of it. It's a LiVox Avia, and I know other companies actually buy these and integrate them on drones. Part of the reason you buy the DJI one is because it's so uh, easily integrated into a single system that you just make a mission plan, push go, and it just kind of so I'll pause there for in a second. Any questions on drone hardware on, uh, on the L1 or anything like that? Just because that is uh, a big one. I know I've seen at least three of them at the, uh, the conference here that people have brought to show off. What's an IP rating? Um, the IP rating, that is, it's waterproof rating. That means it's uh, water, wind, and dust proof, at least for the sensor, the sensor itself. Are those drones available now, or is it difficult to get, uh, get the DJI? Uh, the supply chain's getting better. Uh, the last couple of months, things have usually been about a month back ordered or so on the L1 systems. We're, we're starting to see that ease a little bit. Um, so you can usually find one now, uh, but you might have to wait a couple of weeks. It's not like a nine month back order, thankfully. Is, is the L1, does the camera on the L1 yeah, mechanical global shutter. It's for all practical purposes. If you're that, if you're familiar, it's the same image sensor that's on a Phantom 4 RTK for all practical purposes. Yeah, one inch mechanical, one inch sensor, mechanical shutter, um, 20 megapixels. Pretty good camera. Last question: Are you using your iPhone to drive test this like drone or anything with AI? Nope, it's got its own uh, controller that's built in to integrate that with its own base station and all of that stuff. So a little nicer. They all use the same batteries. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that DJI, being Chinese made, can't power critical infrastructure. Um, can you mount the L1 to a different drone? No, the L1 only flies on the DJI M300. And if, I didn't say critical infrastructure, you actually can do critical infrastructure. The laws surrounding where and when you can fly a DJI drone and it's restrictive is probably worth its own presentation because it's just so complex and it's all based on which agency. Like, the military can't use a DJI drone, but the military can actually hire a contractor that uses a DJI drone, but only on some properties. So like, we've, worked, we've flown these systems, or our clients have flown these systems on Army Corps of Engineer projects, but the Army Corps themselves can't actually buy it. And if it's on an Air Force base then, well then it's actually, it's very complex. But generally speaking, the overwhelming majority of, the, of uh, projects and clients are allowed to use DJI drones. Some municipalities, for uh, if you work for a government agency or a city or a county, some have things against DJI, some have things against just all Chinese hardware. It's one of the harder things with other, even the everybody else category. Um, most of them use Chinese hardware in some capacity. Many of them still use the same plat flight platform, the M300 drone that the L1 is on, and then they just slap on their own custom sensors and integrate those. So it's, very complex and fragmented, but generally speaking, you can still use it on most projects. All right, so let's get into the workflow a little bit. So to get from, uh, from flying a drone to actually getting to your line work, there are a couple of steps that we, always, uh, that we always suggest. The first step is going to be mission planning. Now this is before you go out into the field. This is actually saying, where am I gonna fly? What am I gonna fly? How am I gonna fly? The planning aspect of it. Doesn't take much time, critically important as far as saving you time down the line. Then you go out and you actually collect your data. The drone data collection part, stupid simple.
push go, the drone flies. And that's all it takes, or at least that's all it should take nowadays with the way that these things are. Uh, and you collect whatever other ground data you have. 3D model processing, that's where you start processing your photogrammetry and your LiDAR data into these full resolution, rich point clouds, orthophotos, things like that. And then once you have your rich deliverables, you need to start drafting your line work. You need to digitize that into a simpler tint surface. You need to extract your curve lines. You need to extract your center lines, paint striping, create a usable tint surface, and then finish it in CAD, which is getting everything together. So these are the general steps for any workflow to actually get from, uh, from drone all the way to a final survey. And this is the most common workflow that we see, unfortunately. Especially people just flying out, they fly a drone and they're like, okay, well, I've got a really smart guy in the office, I'm just gonna give him this data and then, uh, then we'll make a bunch of money. And it doesn't quite work that easily because what they find out is this bubble here involves a lot of time and a lot of smart people spending many, many hours processing it. This is not a good workflow. This is the, uh, the academic research workflow that we talk about. Fly your drone and we'll figure something out eventually and eventually we'll probably make money with it. And maybe you will, some people do, and maybe you won't, a lot of people don't. Rather, the better way to do it is to actually have a better workflow, and that will get you those better and more reliable results. So know the data you need up front, have a plan for what you, how you're going to get it, and only process what you need. I mentioned before, a drone lighter system can basically count the leaves on a tree if you need it to, but you don't need it to, so don't count the leaves on a tree. These drone systems, if you're doing a power line survey, they can identify the differences between a transformer, a pole, an insulator, the wire attachment points, the pole tops, pole bases. But if you're doing a topo survey, you don't care about that. So you shouldn't be spending time classifying your power lines if you don't care about the power lines. And conversely, if you do care about the cap power lines, you shouldn't really be worrying too much about the brake lines of the topo underneath because that's not the priority. Know the data you need before you fly. These things have so much data. We live in you know, an era of big data. Everyone says big data, gather more data, get more data. But that is oftentimes going to be your San Francisco startups that don't care about making money. They say, gather all the data and maybe we'll figure out how to make money with it. Most of you guys actually have to care about that last step of how to make money with it. The more data you have, the more it's gonna cost you to process it. So know what you need, get the data, process that data, and then get out. Our workflow, as, uh, specifically on the LiDAR stack, start with collecting your raw data, go through the pre-processing step, that's what I've talked about before, which is going to be uh, geo-referencing it, actually getting the IMU data all together, or yeah, getting your IMU data and uh, GNSS data together. Align your multiple swaths, align your different flights together, geo-reference them, localize them to your project, run some QA, QC, get your control integrated there. Then you can classify your point clouds, separating your ground points from your vegetation points to power lines, power poles, buildings, structures, objects, whatever you need. And then you extract your useful features out of that, which is going to be vectorizing it, right? Turning 100 million ground classified points into a one megabyte tin surface in CAD. That's part of vectorizing and extracting your useful features. Turning this crazy ortho photo into here where the parking stalls are in an auto survey. That's what your, work, your uh, workflow will look like, and I'm gonna go into each one of those steps in uh, detail in a little bit. But to go into this, the first step, as I mentioned, is mission planning. Mission planning is critically important. Really, really important. Like I said, only takes a couple of minutes. Once you're used to it, super easy, but you gotta do it. What is mission planning? Mission planning is asking questions like, is this a good site for drone photogrammetry or LIDAR? Is it just, raw dirt and you don't need LiDAR because you don't need the vegetation penetration and you should probably do a photogrammetry mission. What altitude should you fly at? Well, how big is the site? Uh, what do you need? What's the appropriate overlap for the, for the drone, for the LiDAR? How many control, ground control points should I set? Where should I set my ground control points? Now should I arrange the flight pattern? So why do we ask you, why do we care about mission planning? Well, for starters, it will save you a ton of time in the field. It means that you have to typically go around, set fewer ground control points, survey less things on the ground, shorter flight times is a big one, and the biggest uh, time saver of all is no field revisits. If you plan everything properly so that you don't miss a chunk of data and have to send someone back out, that's how you lose all your time. But it also saves office time as well. 
A well-planned mission means that you can actually process the data quicker, more accurately, get better accuracy, fewer photogrammetry errors, and have a simpler overall workflow when your data is good. Good question. Airspace waivers? In this particular segment of the I think I have it, and I might even have a slide in this, but uh, airspace waivers and airspace authorizations specifically. Um, generally speaking, one of the things we like to say is you can't fly anywhere if you're willing to fill out a paperwork. Um, so we actually work with the FAA a lot to get those authorizations. We've done everything from surveys directly on airport property um, all the way to federal penitentiaries and things like that. Uh, so you can get authorization, it's just a matter of paperwork and talking to the FAA. That's not, as far as we're concerned, a major practical hurdle. You can actually get your, your authorization pretty easily. We, we can have access to the class waiver, but it's just not like it's ever, but it's, uh, you know, when our client talks about Georgia, he said, okay, I want to fly here, well, you can fly here, but never you yeah. don't know how to do it. But don't get to talk about that. Yeah. Sure. And, sure. and that's valid, you know, when I say, is this a good site for drone photogrammetry? If the answer is it's on the property of uh, Harry Reid International Airport in Las Vegas, the answer is no. It is not a good site for drone photogrammetry. They are not going to shut down that airport for you to fly your drone. You need to figure something else out. And that goes back to what I was saying. The drone is not the right tool for every job. If the airspace restrictions are so onerous that you can't fly, fly a drone, then you can't fly a drone. There are some, there are some limitations. Um, the, and like I said before, the drone is not a magic bullet. It is a tool. And when you can use it, and when it is the right tool, it's going to save you a lot of time, but it's not always the right tool. Um, and now LiDAR or photogrammetry, I've talked about that a lot. So LiDAR, as I've mentioned, provides better cover and vegetation. This is a profile view of uh, a hill slope with some trees, and it's got two point clouds that are actually on here. The one that's actually in true color in the back here is going to be your photogrammetry point cloud. And this one that is an uh, elevation color that goes down into blue here is going to be your LiDAR <coughs> cloud. And what you can see from this is that the LiDAR is going to provide much, much better ground cover underneath the trees than the uh, photogrammetry point cloud, but some gaps where the vegetation gets very, very dense. However, a good uh, photogrammetrist or cat tech would be able to interpolate that pretty clearly. So LiDAR does have better uh, cover in vegetation. Photogrammetry, on the other hand, because of its uh, just processing workflow, <coughs> is typically going to be faster, easier, and more accurate on our team. Those are your usual trade-offs. There is one thing that I haven't put in this slide that I really ought to, which is, like I mentioned before, power lines. Power lines are one of the only other examples where uh, LiDAR is going to be far and away better. Again, that's more of a niche use case only for people that actually are doing power line corridor surveys and actually need to measure the wires themselves. Other than that, Photogrammetry is much better in everything except vegetation. When there's vegetation, the LiDAR is going to get you that better uh, surface coverage down there. Um, oh, and photogrammetry is cheaper too. <laughs> I should have mentioned I forgot that I had that bullet point on there. Um, yeah, your photogrammetry drone, you can get a very good photogrammetry drone for 10 grand, whereas your $40,000 uh, DJI L1 is a good LiDAR drone. That's a big price difference. Yeah. What do you think of the P1 camera as a result of you know that? Personally, I don't really like it very much. It is very hamstrung by the only lens that DJI makes on the P1 sensor. It only allows for a 35 millimeter lens, which is a very, very narrow field of view, which means that you have to fly very high, you're covering very small amounts of land, and generating enormous amounts of data. I it's, uh, it's a high quality camera that is hamstrung by the lens, and leads to really, really nasty field workflows. If they come out with that 20, they've promised a 24 millimeter lens, yeah. we'll reevaluate because we think it has a lot of promise. But right now, I hate the V1, honestly. Yeah. It's so much data for negligible improvement over a Phantom 4 or DK. Yeah. yeah. You uh, mentioned that photogrammetry struggles with power lines. Is there anything that uh, you've experienced that you can do with photogrammetry that would increase your success with the power line, like flying? 3D help in those situations, like 3D flight planning? Or? Short answer, no. Not to any level of reliability that we would consider to be field ready that you could use it and actually have confidence that you're gonna get useful data back. Photogrammetry, the way that it works is you need to identify in multiple point, mo multiple photos, the same three-dimensional point. Power lines are not three-dimensional. 
they are technically kind of one-dimensional, right? They are, they are a line. So you can't just say, here's the power line. You have to say, here is the exact point along this power line and find that exact same point in multiple photos. And that is effectively, all, for all practical purposes, impossible to do so reliably at scale. With super high overlap and certain lighting conditions and various other things, it sometimes works. That's not to say it'll never get a power line. It can and it sometimes does uh, get power lines. And we've done more testing than I'd like to admit on trying to get that reliable, and we've not gotten it reliable enough so that we would ever want to deploy it in survey because we can't even tell you exactly here are the circumstances that it works and here's where it doesn't. It's, so no is your, your very your sure. short answer. <laughs> so talking about LiDAR workflows more, LiDAR works best in vegetated areas, like I said. It provides very good ground data under vegetation, typically about two to three tenths of a foot accuracy for true ground under heavy vegetation. That's what our, uh, our testing has kind of revealed. Two to three tests isn't the best in the world, but if it's under heavy vegetation and you need half foot contours, that's good enough. You need one foot contours, easily good enough, even better. Photogrammetry is better on hardscape, and uh, you would want to combine the best of both of these in CAD after the fact. And good workflows are what's going to make all the difference. Using and processing LiDAR is just Working in that LiDAR point cloud, it is far more time consuming than photogrammetry. As software improves and becomes more marketed, uh, marketable, we expect the amount of time that it takes to process LiDAR data to come down. But right now, boy, it takes a lot of time to process LiDAR data. And bad workflows just take that and multiply it maybe even more. So now here's a, one of the other slides I promised, which is, or sorry, question? Yeah, what do you think about using AIs on your LiDAR data to uh, filter out Helps, still takes work. Yeah. Um, and because there are a lot of judgment calls, we work with a lot of these, these algorithms here. And one of the things that I, that I pointed out, I think I have a slide on this, I think I talk about it in the uh, uh, presentation tomorrow, is that you have to make judgment calls like what is ground, right? If you have a ground surface and then you have a stockpile there, 45 degree angles is a cone, is that stockpile ground? Well, it's dirt, so in one sense it's ground, but if you're measuring volumetrics, then it's not. That's a stockpile, and you want to measure the ground by classifying that as something else, and that's just one example, right? And then there are other things that are very hard to tell. Take a car or something. Imagine the shape of a car. Now put it under a tree and look at it from a LiDAR perspective, and you see a lump, the shape of a car. What the heck is that? Is that a car? Is that a hill? Is that a bush? A human is very good at using judgment calls to say it's like, oh, well, there are four of them in a row that all are the same size. That's clearly four cars in a parking lot. I can wipe those out. AI is terrible at that sort of stuff right now. I, I am very intrigued by the promise of artificial intelligence for point cloud classification. Um, and it certainly has a place in accelerating the processing workflow, but it is very, very far from being a push button, magic, everything works type thing. Um, so yeah, why you should not use LiDAR. You know, honestly, if I can do the most help for anyone in this room today, it's convincing some of you to not buy a LiDAR system. That sounds weird, but that is the best way that I can help you, is if you're on the fence and it's the wrong system for you, don't buy it. You'll spend so much money and you won't be happy with it. And you make the supply chains worse for people like me to try and get LiDAR to other people that do need it. But it is very expensive. They are bulky and hard to fly. For anyone that's flown that M300, that thing's, it's a beast. It's a, kind of a pain in the butt. Phantom 4 RTK, you throw that on the ground, push go, by the time it's 300 feet in the air, no one, no one hears it, it's just invisible. That M300, you can hear it. The batteries are so big, you can't put them on an airplane if you ever need to. It's just a lot of stuff to carry more lighter, bigger, heavier, harder to use. The accuracy is not going to be photogrammetry. So if you don't need LiDAR, don't use it. Photogrammetry, cheaper, faster, better. We love it. Processing takes much more time, and you have to run it in parallel with photogrammetry, too, to actually get your good data. LiDAR does not replace a photogrammetry workflow. It supplements it. That means it's more processing time. So if you, if you live here in Las Vegas and work in Las Vegas, you really probably should not be getting LiDAR because there's just not enough vegetation to justify it. Use a photogrammetry drone, you will be so much happier for doing that. If, however, we got some people from Washington and the Seattle area and you are just living underneath pine trees your whole life, okay, LiDAR makes sense, that's a much better use. So 
If I can help anyone today, the most help I can do is convincing someone out of buying a LiDAR system that doesn't need it, and I apologize to all the hardware sales reps that are in the other room. <laughs> so, in summary, only use LiDAR in vegetated areas. Here are a couple examples. This is enough tree cover that, yes, LiDAR would very much help you get good, clean topo underneath all of that. This, great example, that's a lot of trees. LiDAR would be perfect in getting topo in there. This, still some trees, but sparse enough that photogrammetry is going to be a much better workflow here. You don't need it for that tiny little crown underneath there that you can interpolate very, very reliably with photogrammetry. Or clear stockpiles, vegetation, or totally no vegetation, completely graded uh, oil pads or housing subdivisions. Use photogrammetry, not LiDAR. Find the right tool for the job and use it. As far as setting ground control points for LiDAR, this is a big part of uh, the mission planning as well. How many ground control points do you set? How do you set them? We recommend a minimum of three ground control points with, uh, for, um, uh, for any flight that you do, partly because the uh, <coughs> geo-referencing is really, really robust for most of these LiDAR systems. However, we always recommend using control points. Always. A lot of, uh, again, sorry to some of the hardware guys out there, um, anyone that says, that as a surveyor, you can do a LiDAR job and you don't need any control, I think they're crazy. Partly because you don't just fly a LiDAR drone and uh, have everything in WGS-84. Most of your projects are going to be localized. You're going to localize your control to a single point. Heck, it might be a completely arbitrary 5,000, 5,000 coordinate system and you need to localize your project at that. Um, it just increases the redundancy so much to have ground control points, make sure that it's accurate, and then make sure that your LiDAR data is in the right data with everything else, error checks it. We think uh, ground control points are for really necessary for any surveyor that actually cares about saying that they have good accuracy. Um, using high contrast colors actually really helps as well. It's funny, this is what a colorized point cloud is. And this, I promise to you, I swear, this is the same point of the project in the same point cloud, this is the LiDAR one. Didn't make this up. Took a lot of time to make sure that these are exactly the same things in photogrammetry and LiDAR. But you can't tell. Um, identifying the, uh, the center point of a ground control point uh, is actually a little tricky in LiDAR because that LiDAR is uncolorized. By the time you add colorization to it, that actually often introduces its own error because of um, the asynchronous method of collecting light on photogrammetry or and, uh, the imagery data that colorizes it. Um, yeah? So you do three GCPs, but probably more targets out there are the checkpoints, right? Or yeah, checkpoints. typically more targets with the checkpoint, depending on how comfortable you are and how reliable you are with the workflow and system. Once people really build up a reliable workflow, they're comfortable setting a lot fewer GCPs just because they're, they're aware of how to do it. And any other uh, anything else you shoot on the ground, if you're shooting in utilities or something, you can use as check shots as well, typically. So would you do the 20 horizontal checks that the SPRX recommends, or if you, you feel well, comfortable? No, only if you want to certify it. Okay. If you want certified accuracy according to ASPRS standards, then you need to set that many independent check, check shots, and you need to treat them like independent check shots, and they need to be 3D locatable. Um, but that is only if you actually need to certify your accuracy, which is, again, one of those things, it's a more time-consuming workflow. Uh, you can do it, but most projects do not need the accuracy of the photogrammetry or LiDAR itself to be independently uh, certified by a photogrammetry. Yeah? I was hearing like uh, black is, well, I, I see it in point cloud too. Black is a kind of a bad color. Uh, you want to use something a little less dark. And I, especially like on these liners on the beach pads or there's any kind of, it just solid black or glossy, and it just it throws that LiDAR, even photogrammetry, at issue with it. That's true. Well, uh, I swear it wasn't a plan. We actually sell our own custom ground control points. They're bright pink and bright green, and they are matte painted, paper, biodegradable, disposable, and you can buy them on Amazon. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, those things, that we use those, our photogrammetrists actually are the ones that made it because they hate glossy control points. They actually don't like black and white either. Bright pink and green, you can spot from a mile away. And they're paper, so you leave them in the field and they turn to mush in six months. So yeah. there you go. Search ground control points on Amazon. They'll be the number one result. <laughs> um, let's talk flight altitude a little bit with LiDAR as well. This is a big part of mission planning. Choosing the right flight altitude for what you need. There are trade-offs. Trade-offs come in terms of accuracy and the amount of area that you cover. 
When you fly high at 400 acres, you can typically, typically cover 50 acres per flight battery. I should point out these are approximate numbers. There are lots of things that play into it, overlap, uh, wind conditions, blah, blah, blah. You can almost always get this and usually exceed it, right? If everything works out perfectly, you can sometimes cover 100 acres in a single 400 foot flight. So these are very approximate numbers here. The downside is when you do fly at, fly at five, uh, sorry, 400 feet, your photogrammetry accuracy is typically gonna be better than two tenths of a foot, but you're not gonna get that sub-tenth of a foot accuracy uh, on hardscape. And your lighter is gonna be about three tenths. When you fly what we would consider to be very, very low, 150 feet, is about the floor that we would ever recommend flying a LiDAR system or a photogrammetry system for that matter. You are going to get better than a tenth accuracy on photogrammetry and your LiDAR may be about a tenth of a foot, but flip side is you're only covering five acres per, uh, per job site, generates a whole bunch of data to do that as well. Um, another thing, this is one of those parts that's really interesting as we're starting to do a lot more research is that lighting conditions actually play into LiDAR a lot as well. The DJI L1, sorry if this is getting too uh, sciencey, it actually uses a 905 nanometer wavelength laser. This is the actually the spectrum of what the sun puts out. This is gonna be what your eye can see. This is where the DJI laser is right here. Um, and what that means is that it actually can be impacted much more by bright sunny days. With photogrammetry, photogrammetry generally speaking works better in higher light conditions. LiDAR is a little bit, uh, a little bit less so. It actually works a little bit better in more darker overcast conditions. This one, uh, or do we have a lot of testing scheduled uh, from the coming weeks. We're gonna test flying it at high noon, overcast, and even at night to compare a lot of the, the final results of, these, uh, of the LiDAR system and see how meaningful of an impact it is. We know from the science that there is an impact here. The question is how much does, does this impact you on an actual operational basis, right? Does changing the time of your flight improve your accuracy, or does it improve your coverage? And if so, does it improve it by 2% or 50%? Those are some of the things that we want to really test in real world conditions, but just one of the, the cool things that we're, we're testing on the uh, over the coming weeks with, with our LiDAR sensors, particularly as it applies to uh, small objects like power lines, which I've mentioned a lot. Very thin power lines in the wrong lighting conditions won't be picked up by a light, LiDAR scanner, oftentimes because they, uh, the system will consider it to be noise. The actual LiDAR sensor itself will consider it to be noise coming from the, uh, the ambient sunlight, not from the laser scanner itself. So all things that we're looking at, I think it's pretty, pretty cool to see this level of uh, technological advancement on the LiDAR systems. As far as overlap, another big thing in mission planning, Photogrammetry and LiDAR overlap is very different. Um, there are always different requirements for different systems. Traditional photogrammetry, when you're flying with your million dollar metrically calibrated cameras, can get away with much lower overlap than drones, which even with the, like L1 or Phantom 4, is going to be a digital camera, not nearly as high quality as the million dollar cameras, obviously. Um, so LiDAR typically works in scare quotes there with very low overlap, but it isn't recommended. Uh, I think the L1 really annoyingly has the default uh, overlap set to like 30 or 35% out of the box, which again, it works, but we found that to be a very unreliable workflow in the sense that it's not as good at finding those gaps in the leaves for vegetated areas. Uh, it actually has some issues with high scan angles kind of peeling up and providing a little bit of air, so being able to post-process that with a little bit more redundancy improves your accuracy. So our recommendations for overlap based on all of our testing so far, 75-75 overlap for uh, photogrammetry and about 60 to 65% swap to swap overlap for LiDAR. That, again, that is typically a little bit higher overlap than what the manufacturers are going to recommend. It does take a little bit more time in the field, but we found that uh, to increase that, the reliability of workflow factor enough that it justifies the uh, little bit of additional time to be and a little bit more data. And I'm sensitive to that because I say there is too much, uh, such a thing as too much data. Um, too much data means more time in the field, way longer processing time, larger files. Heck, anyone that's ever tried to transfer uh, LiDAR data from the field using a hotspot knows that it can take forever and it can burn up your data plan on a single project. Uh, and it even creates some erroneous matches in photogrammetry. So solutions are generally fly higher. 
fly as high as you can get away with. It will generate less data and make a much simpler workflow as long as it will get you the uh, accuracy you need. Only use LiDAR when you need it. If you don't need LiDAR, don't use LiDAR. I can't say that enough. Uh, and also avoid your overlap overkill. We say go a little higher, 60 to 65%. Don't take that to mean, well, 60% is good, then 90% is better. No, it's not. No, not true. There, there is an upper limit. Once you get that high, you are just wasting time and wasting data and uh, making things terrible. So 60 to 65%, that's kind of our Goldilocks zone right now as far as I know. Yeah, sir. Why didn't you say earlier that 150 feet about flows if you want to go? Any lower than 150 feet and you suffer from uh, what I like to call is trying to survey through a drinking straw. You're so close to the ground that when the drone is actually looking through, the footprint is so incredibly narrow that when it's trying to actually interpolate one photo to the next, such a tiny little plot of ground that actually introduces air, that the number of photos that it has to jump between to actually model a surface introduces air when you start flying lower than 150 feet for a photogrammetry doesn't mean it's impossible. There are some very unusual circumstances where we would recommend 100 feet or something. Basically never below 100 feet, even in unusual circumstances. But I call it the drinking straw effect. You can see so little ground being that close that it's not good for actually surveying the property. All right. So any other questions on the field workflow, planning, setting, actually flying a drone? Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, the L1 is capable of flying just a pure photogrammetry mission, and if you do that, it is effectively a bigger, more expensive Phantom 4 RTK. Data-wise, that, that image sensor is identical. So if you don't have a Phantom 4 RTK, that's fine, you can do that. You can set it to a photogrammetry-only mission and fly that, and it works absolutely fine, and the data is great. Perfect for processing, perfect for photogrammetry-only. Um, but yes. <laughs> Oh, I hate the Mavic 2 Pro. Uh, it's got a, um, sorry, if anyone owns one. Um, it has a linear rolling shutter camera on it, which introduces a considerable amount of air into the project, uh, particularly at larger sites. The Mavic series of drones and anything with a linear rolling shutter camera at all, including things like a lot of the popular Autel drones out there, most of them have uh, linear rolling shutter cameras, in my opinion, are only appropriate for smaller projects uh, on the order of you know, maybe 10, 15 acres or so. Um, and you typically have to set considerably more control to compensate for the error introduced by the rolling shutter. Yes, there is software that compensates for linear rolling shutter. It is good, it is not perfect. We have done this a lot. It is, there still is error on it. We generally recommend if you're using a rolling shutter camera, one, We'd really like for you to upgrade. We think your data will be better and will make your lives uh, happier. But uh, if not, it should really only be used on smaller projects with a good amount of control. You start using it on bigger projects and you'll see three or four tenths of a foot of air vertically, which totally busts outside of our, uh, our accuracy tolerances or something. When we see a shot that's three tenths of a foot off, that's like panic in our office when our photogram photogrammetry model is more than, more than three tenths off. bigger issue on the bigger projects, and that's the other thing that you said there is you have to set a ton of control. P4R, you might have to set key control points on you know, a big site or something like that, and with a P4RTK, you can fly it and set five control points, set another 10 check shots just to make yourself comfortable, and you still save yourself a whole bunch of time in the field. Um, terrain awareness, I know we talked about this quite a bit, that have they fixed the protocol on that? Because I know we end up having to do advanced adjusting the elevation. <laughs> on the Phantom 4 RTK? Yeah. Not perfectly. It's still a, a little bit of a clunky system. DJI software has a little bit of room to improve, uh, more than a little bit of room to improve on uh, on getting the terrain awareness. So it works, but you still have to jump through some hoops. The L1 actually is incapable of terrain awareness on LiDAR flights right now, which is a weird software bug. 
that uh, seems unusual. You can run the L1 in terrain awareness, but only on photogrammetry missions. I'm not sure why. We're trying to figure that out and pushing DJI to, to update that software as well. But right now, you have to terrace those missions if you're doing L1 with significant elevation change. Do you see the actual work for, uh, I think, that RTK as well? Oh, for a correction network? No, no yeah, for the whole uh, flight plan. They do mm -hmm. terrain following, uh, mission planning, you run it from your laptop, start with laptop, use control, or whatever. Cool. However, I, I did have an issue one day. That, you know, I fly a lot of lighter missions at night. Yeah. And uh, it was on a battery change, and I'm on a hillside. It was, it, the, where it was going was lower than where I'm charting. Instead of, it, it had the train model, had everything in there, lifts four feet off the ground, turns towards me in the Jeep, and full throttle. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> and, uh, Wait, can I ask what drone are you flying? The, uh, uh, the 300 with the rock. Ah, there you go. The, uh, yeah, got it. Yeah. Yeah. We had the same thing with our RTK. Yeah. You know, we grab the battery change and read the chance and press the stop towards the test of a cell phone phone. It's, yeah. it's yeah. tricky. You gotta be careful now. Yeah, yeah. 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 they go with it. Yep. That happens. All right. So let's jump into uh, the office processing workflow a little bit. Like I said, today I've, I've already spent you know an hour talking about um, a lot of the kind of planning, hardware, all of that stuff. So I'm going to go a little bit quick through the office processing workflow. And if you're interested, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on the office side of things uh, at my talk tomorrow at 1.30. So as I've mentioned a dozen times by now, LiDAR adds complexity to the workflow. But as far as we are concerned, and what all the data is showing, that the best workflows use both LiDAR and photogrammetry data. They can be run in parallel or in series. That means at the same time, you can either have a LiDAR team and a photogrammetry team running them separately at the same time, or in series, you have your drone guy or something that runs both uh, LiDAR, or runs the LiDAR first and the photogrammetry first. But one of the key things is avoiding double work and actually making this an efficient workflow. It is possible to make this an efficient workflow, but as I mentioned before, you gotta have a plan. You gotta know what you're talking about. So here's just an example of what a series workflow might look like for if you have a single person that's processing, or you're the single person that's processing all the LiDAR data, you might start by actually, with your data, creating your photogrammetry, photogrammetric outputs first. Your uh, point clouds, your tints, your ortho photos. You extract as much as you can from the photogrammetry. That might be your center lines, your current lines, as much topo data as you can. And then you actually go through and create your LiDAR outputs and you classify and extract the LiDAR features when in the areas where you know there are gaps in photogrammetry. That's a great way. You get photogrammetry first, say, here are my gaps, throw that into a program with your LiDAR data, say, here's where I need to extract some LiDAR data, get some topo data out of there, put it all together, blend it in CAD, and get yourself a final deliverable. This is, an act, this is a great, uh, great workflow for smaller companies with individual drone people. Uh, if you're the drone specialist that runs all your photogrammetry and LiDAR and data extraction, this is probably the workflow you want to use. Once you get a little bit bigger, once you're processing more data, depending on who you work with, a parallel workflow might make a lot more sense, where you actually start with procedures for splitting li LiDAR and photogrammetry. Rules or a project where you say, here's the vegetated areas, that's for you, LiDAR team. Here's the, uh, the hardscape areas, that's for you, photogrammetry team. Split them off, your photogrammetry guy actually runs through your, your PIX4D, creates the point clouds, creates the surface, extracts the features. Your LiDAR team runs your LiDAR pre-processing, swap, swap alignment, point cloud classification, creates ground surface and extracts the data, and then you blend it all in CAD. This is the workflow that we use internally when we process LiDAR data because we have LiDAR specialists, we have photographic specialists, we have line work drafters uh, in CAD techs as well. And for us, the final part, and really the only time that the LiDAR data and the photogrammetry data actually finally meet is going to be in Civil 3D when they're already in these very lightweight, easy to digest deliverables. Um, and then you can export your final deliverable, which might be a PDF or a DWG or a CAD file or anything like that. But this is a, a much better workflow to actually get projects done with specialized labor and the fastest too, because you can have multiple people working on a single project at one time and get things turned around very, very quickly. But it is a bit more advanced because these procedures are kind of the tricky part, right? Making sure that everyone's aware of how to split it apart. When you're splitting apart, how do you make sure that everything's controlled and in the same datum so you don't import it and then your LiDAR data is two feet off because someone controlled it wrong or you used a different vertical datum or something weird like that? 
Um, so the procedures are gonna be one of the critical parts to get right in this. The, your series workflow is more reliable and simple, just straight through a line can be done by an individual person. Your parallel workflow, a little bit more complex, requires a little bit more planning and organization, but you're gonna be able to scale it up a lot more as well. So to just kind of jump through a lot of those individual steps, photogrammetry, for those of you that aren't aware, is uh, you know, the science of creating a 3D model out of photos. You start with the photos and ground control points, and that creates a point cloud, an ortho photo, and a digital surface model. Those are all things that we at least consider to be intermediate outputs, because rarely is that the only thing that you want. You've got to go further. You have to create a tin surface. You have to clean it. You have to draft it, get into the CAD. Those are your intermediate outputs. You have your LiDAR data, you need to process it together, you need to align your flight lines. This is an extremely exaggerated example of multiple flight lines not, uh, not lining up or multiple individual flights. You need to rotate, scale, and translate accordingly, depending on what uh, <coughs> coordinate system or transformations you're using there. Georeference it to the project, classify your point cloud, classify and extract your data. Again, this is what we're talking about in detail tomorrow, of actually getting your ground surface here so that you can turn uh, this was a very heavily forested project there, but creating a digital elevation model, converting it all into useful formats, extracting your vectorized features. This is one that's often uh, overlooked, I feel. A lot of people get a LiDAR point cloud, and even once they, they have their clean, classified, perfect LiDAR point cloud, they then take it and they say, all right, I'm going to export a tin surface using only 200,000 points and try and get it in the CAD and it's still a pain in the butt because Civil 3D hates all big files for whatever reason. So, extracting vectorized features, getting your 200,000 or even your 200 million point point cloud into a series of topo shots on a grid mixed with a series of brake lines is going to get you a much, much, much smaller and more easy to use file that you can then even email it. Uh, full point clouds, like I said, are just not CAD compatible. Anyone who's ever tried to put a 100 million point, point cloud in Civil 3D um, has probably, you know, set their computer on fire afterwards. And then Civil 3D 2020 is not doing mass files, right? You have to convert it and recap or something? Yeah, you, have, you do have to get it and recap. It's a mess. Sure. But I should point out, uh, one, I'm a photogrammetrist and LiDAR tech, not a Civil 3D expert. I'm sure you guys know more about that than me. Um, but also, we just don't, we don't even try anymore. We, we don't try and input point clouds into Civil 3D. We know there are ways that you can hack around and get it into it. We've got, I, uh, I know the, the head of our, our CAD team, it's like, yeah, look, we can do it. I'm like, yeah, is it hard? It's like, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> so we don't even, we don't mess with uh, point clouds in Civil 3D at all, even though it's possible through various groups. But yeah, finishing it in CAD, taking then this blend of photogrammetry, LiDAR data, creating a single unified surface. And that surface may even include other ground shots that you've taken. Or, you know, maybe there are shots underneath a freeway overpass that you need to, uh, to model. Adding all of your culture, your annotations, your symbols, your blocks, uh, getting it all in the right proper uh, layers and layer template, that's what we call finishing in CAD. So to summarize what a, what a good office workflow kind of looks like, you start with your photos, ground control, uh, and RTK, goes through the photogrammetry process, that ought to create you an ortho photo, digital surface model of a point cloud, go through that line work drafting, vectorization, that will get you your 3D points, polylines, usually in a DXF format, something kind of simple, throw that all into CAD, and that's how you get it into your DWG, adding your surface contours to create a final deliverable. That's your photogrammetry workflow in a nutshell. And then in parallel, you have that LiDAR workflow where you collect your raw data, pre-process it to actually create a point cloud, align it and georeference it to your project, classify it into the, into the uh, point cloud classification that you need, and extract the features. And typically from there, once you extract your features, you import that into CAD, merge it with photogrammetry, and create your final deliverables. A little complex, this is kind of a newer-ish workflow for us, so I feel like uh, in a year or two, I'll probably get some of these graphics to be a little bit more simple and user-friendly. But at least for right now, this is, uh, this is a good way to do it. Um, since we are running a little short on time, I'm gonna blast through some of this uh, photogrammetry. When using photogrammetry correctly, everyone says, oh, what's the right settings? There is no magical set of settings. It's all about the workflow, not about the settings. The same camera on a different project on a different day will have different processing settings in order to actually get high quality deliverables out of it. 
having a good uh, workflow, understanding the nuance, that's important. So rather than photogrammetry, oh yeah, question. That's not the reuse tool for the program. Uh, short answer is all of them. Longer answer is Pix4D is our primary photogrammetry engine. Um, I, I will put a plug in here. The other major photogrammetry software out there is Agisoft Metashape. That is a Russian software. Do not use it. Uh, do not give any money to that regime. In fact, hopefully they'll get sanctioned and you won't be able to buy it. But uh, that is the, the major software. There are a lot of other softwares out there. Pix4D and Agisoft Metashape are the two big ones out there. But again, uh, I, I could not strongly recommend against Agisoft enough at this point. It's not because it's a bad software, but uh, for other reasons. <laughs> Um, so, LiDAR processing. Let's go into this with a little bit more detail with, uh, with the time that we've got left. The point cloud creation is that first step, that pre-processing step, that, uh, what we call pre-processing. That's where you go from a raw, often proprietary data format to a clean, useful point cloud. For the L1, that's going to be things like an IMU and an RTV and an RTL, RTS files and all of that sort of stuff. Um, the exact steps and software for that point cloud creation are going to be different for each hardware stack, depending on which hardware you bought, who your integrator is, what system they wanted you to do. They're all gonna be kind of bespoke. I'm most familiar with the L1, and again, that is the most common out there. Um, so that's what, uh, what I'll be talking about a little bit. But either way, your GMSI, GMSS and IMU processing is usually fairly black boxy in that you don't actually have too many choices of what you can do under the hood. You just kind of throw all of the data at it, pick an output coordinate system, and say, create my LAS uh, point cloud file for me. Um, aside from a couple density options and uh, usually what that output coordinate system is, you don't have too much, too many levers to pull. You can sometimes use different um, different base stations to try and reprocess it again. Very custom, you kind of need to talk to your own hardware, whoever sold you the hardware, to figure out exactly how to do that step. Then you've got to align your swaps. When you uh, export LiDAR data, even with really good GNSS data, sometimes the swaps are going to be misaligned. It may be based on the baseline distance of your uh, GPS system. Maybe you moved and localized your base system to something different. Maybe you didn't localize each individual flight, which is a perfectly acceptable workflow, I should point out. Um, but you need to align your swaps as one flight to the next flight. They can often have uh, differences where they don't align perfectly. You gotta be aware that there are all types of shifts possible. Horizontal, vertical, rotation, and scale. It's very easy to look at a profile view like this and say, oh, clearly I need to just move this red line up. And you look over here and the red line's higher. That means there's something else other than just vertical going on. Very common, horizontal shifts, rotation, scaling is all in the cards when it comes to aligning these slots. You need to geo-reference it using uh, those GCPs, get your point cloud together. Point cloud classification, this is uh, where you actually, uh, you were talking about AI too. This is where we use a heavy mix of semi-automated and manual classification. The semi-automated helps a lot with good algorithms, but absolutely requires a human eye, if for no other reason than QA, QC after the fact. This is also one of the coolest things. This is one of the most rapidly advancing fields in, uh, in kind of the processing of, uh, of LiDAR data right now is the automation and different software tools around point cloud classification. Because it's known that this is a huge, huge, huge time sink. And one of the other things with uh, point cloud classification though is always asking yourself at the beginning, what do I really need to classify? And I've mentioned this before, so this one you can see, this is clearly a profile view of a set of power lines. And uh, this one, you can, we very clearly classify the power pole as different from the lines. Now that actually takes a lot of time, especially at the interface where the plant lines actually attach and, uh, attach to the insulators. Well, if you don't need that, don't do it. Don't use the software that says even the automated routines might take, you know, just five or 10 minutes to actually run and crank through all the data. That's a waste of time. Don't classify it. The majority of our LiDAR projects, the LiDAR is used to get ground. We classify ground and not everything else. Because on a final survey, usually, again, always exceptions, but usually you don't need to know low vegetation, medium vegetation, high vegetation, uh, object, building, snow, all of those other, any of the dozens of different uh, point cloud classes out there, or infinite if you want to make them up, but uh, you just care about ground. So we have ground and everything else. 
That's our usual thing because that's usually all you have to do is just classify ground if what you are using it is for is topo, which is what a lot of the LiDAR stuff is for. So don't classify everything. If you're using it for topo, doesn't matter if it's a building, a tree, or a car, it's ground or it's not ground. That's enough, that'll save you a huge amount of time as far as classifying the point clouds. Now, the inevitable next question I get is, okay, well, what software do you use? So point cloud classification is a pain in the butt, and it is, and it's time consuming. And the uh, kind of unfortunate answer is, there really is no magic bullet out there. Uh, these are all softwares that we have familiarity with that we have used to certain extents. Um, they pretty much all have their trade-offs, and they all kind of have a long learning curve as well. So generally speaking, if you're already, you know, deep in the Leica, Leica ecosystem, then use one of Leica's softwares, it is more than capable enough to do it, and you will be frustrated by certain things and say this is taking way too much time, and you're right. And maybe some other software will do one thing better and not the other. Some softwares are better at power line identification. Some are better at uh, the number of different ways that you can adjust the ground classification algorithms and that sort of thing. So our recommendation for this, like I said, is unfortunately no magic bullet and use what you're most comfortable with. If you're in any of these ecosystems, great, use it. That sounds wonderful. Or shameless plug, that's what we do in the business too, <laughs> uh, as I said. So classifying and filtering it, removing your vegetation buildings. And like I said, be aware there will still be gaps. The vegetation is not perfect. This is also what really screws with a lot of the artificial intelligence and your various algorithms. It looks at something like this, and then it starts putting ground points up here, or ground points up here where there are gaps in the true coverage. Whereas any human with half a sense can say, okay, well clearly the ground interpolates under there, right? And then you can tweak some of your settings, you can tweak, tweak it, and it'll work great for this project, and then you use that, uh, that set of neural net results for a next project, and it screws up the next project, and you have to manually change it. So again, a lot of promise on AI, but still requires manual tweaking to adjust some of those, uh, those software routines for each individual project. Ask yourself, is it worth the time? I'm running out of time here, so I'm gonna blast through this, especially because this is the stuff I'm covering uh, later. And then um, converting your point cloud. Even once you get that final point cloud, it's still gonna be hundreds of millions of points uh, of classified data. You wanna actually convert that into vectorized data. How do you do that? Our general favorite workflow right now, this is not an absolute must, but our work, general workflow, is start with the point cloud and convert it into a raster grid. This is what a, a rasterized grid digital surface model is going to look like. This is actually the same project up here. This is all you know, densely vegetated, some uh, leaves, some no leaves, and this is your raster DEM, which I love. It's so cool that you can even see the, uh, the crowns of trees, where the trees themselves are non-ground, but the ground actually curves up a little bit as it goes to the tree trunk. It's, and you can actually even see tire ruts, because uh, um, there's clearly a, a road under here, that you can see the tire ruts. That's how accurate this stuff is through vegetation. It's really, really cool stuff. But converting it into a raster grid, then converting that raster grid into a uh, very lightweight and cat-friendly set of points and polylines to actually create your tin surface, that's our preferred workflow for digitizing this. So that you can go from your ortho, you can kind of tell this is a photogrammetry-derived ortho because it's got gaps in the vegetation, to your, uh, your digital elevation model. Line work drafting, like I said, it's reducing it to that cat-friendly surface, much like a, um, point cloud classification, there is no magic bullet software, line work is a fairly tedious thing to do to actually digitize and vectorize all of your features. Here are a handful of them that are capable of that. Uh, again, some better than others, no magic bullet there really. Ultimately, line work drafting just takes a lot of time. A little bit of, hum of computer time and a whole lot of human time to just draft it right now. More things that AI is promising but requires so much cleanup that it's of not a huge amount of help. Having good QA, QC, and just acknowledging no magic solutions here yet. Cat finishing, creating it into uh, an actual final uh, survey deliverable, putting everything together, merge your photogrammetry and LiDAR, surface and cat, custom layer templates, blah, 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 cat-friendly imagery so that you can actually use it properly in CAD, because like, as much as, man, I'm really crapping on Civil 3D a lot today, but. Um, <laughs> 
But yeah, you can't throw a gigabyte ortho photo into Civil 3D either, so you actually have to compress it. We use very uh, proprietary compression algorithms to actually get it into something that Civil 3D can use to create that final survey, which should look the same whether it was made conventionally or with the drone or with the total station or GPS. So, to wrap things up, and I'll, then I'll open the floor for questions. I've said this before, that's how I started, and it's how I'm going to finish it. The goal of drone programming is to save time and money. I talked about a lot of different ways that you can sink, into, sink money and time into a drone program and not get anything. My goal and my hope from this presentation is that you some, learn some things, some pitfalls that you can avoid so that you don't have to make a, the same mistakes that a lot of people did as far as getting this thing, uh, getting the drone program set up. And pick the right tool for the job. And the LiDAR sensor is an amazing tool. And it is just that. It is a tool, not the tool. It works in concert with everything else in a surveyor's truck, and that is important. And also, use a complete workflow. If you try and skip one of these steps, you will pay for it down the line. I promise you that much. The, the five minutes of mission planning, if that saves you one field revisit, it has paid for itself for the next year and a half. Like, it's so important to use that complete workflow. Um, and also the, the shameless plug slide right here at the end is part of the reason we know this is we do this for a company. We do this for a living. We provide drone data processing for land surveyors and civil engineers. That's pretty much all we do. You fly the drone, send us the data, and we give you every, we go through all of these steps with our highly trained people to get you a CAD file with a clean tint surface and CAD friendly ortho photos and all of that, and you can do so at a very competitive price because that's all we do, and we think we're pretty darn efficient at it. So, thank you all for your time and attention. If you would like a copy of the slides and a copy of the video uh, presentation as well, you can either uh, sign up on aerotoss.com slash westbed22 or shoot me an email at logan at aerotoss.com. So with that, thank you for your time and attention today, and I will open up the floor to any more questions that you may have. All right, we'll start up front. Okay, uh, so I have a V1, I have an H20T. Yep. Um, well, so if the P1 is all you got right now, use the P1. I have both. Uh, yeah, I would use the P1 over the H1. Over the H1. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's got a higher quality image sensor. For all that, I don't like it over a lot of other options out there, but it's still a very capable one. It's just, it, you have to fly high and it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah? I noticed you didn't mention me the GMQ hardware or software. Is, um, do you not like the systems or the processing? Uh, we, we find it to have a slightly less reliable workflow. The data is very high quality, we like the data. Um, and, but what we have found is that it often has a couple more issues and things just like mission planning and overlap. I'm not super familiar with like GOQ specific mission planning software, what they use. What we have found is that on the data side, there, there seem to be a lot more just kind of like human mistakes in there. Oh shoot, we didn't fly, we should have flown one or two flight lines further out. We plan the overlap slightly wrong and it just causes a couple of those little problems. When it works, it works great. It generates a lot of data too. It's, it's like the, the output folder from some of the GOQ software is, ooh, it's a lot of data. So that, that itself takes, it, it's all part of that reliability and ease of use. The data is very high quality. The reliability and ease of use is lower than, so data quality, better than an L1. Reliability, ease of use of the workflow, not as good as the L1. Those are the trade-offs on, on the GOQ specifically. What software do you use to process the data sets? To process what type of data sets? Yeah, combine GNSS and IMU data. Uh, so combining your GNSS and IMU data, that's gonna be the, uh, the proprietary one that comes with whatever drone system you use. For the L1, it's DJI's proprietary DJI Terra software. Uh, that is the only thing you can use. I'm not sure if anyone's figured out how to like backwards compatible, uh, undo that software, make their own version. But yeah, it's proprietary for whatever the drone hardware, whatever drone hardware you have. Anything else before I uh, hold it, let everyone go? All right. Thank you again for all the time. I really appreciate it.